Welcome to the Your Story is Our Story podcast, brought to you by the new 3 rsorg which is dedicated to telling the social justice stories of yesterday and today. My name is Neil Foote, host of this podcast, where we will have honest, heartfelt, and heart-wrenching conversations about race and culture in our communities. This podcast is our simple way of helping you to join us in our mission, which simply says, by using stories of social justice to dismantle racism, the new three R's unlock civic and compassionate leadership at school, at home, and at work. We offer programs and resources to educate and empower children, parents, educators, and workplace leaders through a lens of racial justice and racial awareness. The new 3Rs educates and empowers through the art of social justice storytelling, building relationships, and fostering a sense of responsibility. We are creating a more civic and compassionate society, one child at a time. Thanks for joining us today, and remember to follow us on social at the new 3Rs. That's the new N-E-W, the number 3Rs. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Your Story is Our Story podcast. Today, we continue our series talking about moral responsibility. And in this conversation, we were picking up kind of where we left off in our last three episodes, where we had some wonderful parents and moms talking about their fight for change, uh, change in our school systems, our public school systems, fighting for equity. Uh, and particularly fighting to make sure that race culture uh, is playing into the curriculum at our schools. Today in our conversation, you know, features one of the students who's been actively involved, uh, not only in his own school, but also in our three R's programs. And we have two of our mentor moms here who are been again, inspired Uh, as much by the students themselves, as well as the great work that they're already doing in their communities to change the schools. Welcome to the Your Story is Our Story podcast. I want to introduce you to Jasper Anthony. Jasper, welcome to our podcast. Tell everyone a little bit about yourself uh, and your school, and uh, we'll dive into the conversation. Thank you, Neil. Uh, I am Jasper Kavanaugh Anthony. Uh, I am 12 years old. I live in Los Angeles, California, and I attend Franklin, uh, Benjamin Franklin Dual Language Academy, which is a high school and a middle school together. And as I said, it's dual language. So I speak both English and Spanish at school. Um, and, you know, my school, the middle school portion of the middle school is 180 kids versus Burbank's, the Burbank school, which is, you know, a mile and a half away. And that's got a thousand kids, but it's only a middle school. So I chose the smaller dual language um, school because I thought, you know, me and my parents thought it would be better to learn a second language so I could go to other countries because Spanish is the second most spoken language. So that's kind of more about me and my school and a little bit of my education-ness. That's great. And I, I too studied Spanish uh, uh, because I, growing up in New York, that was, that's, that's made a lot of sense. And I used that to uh, when I went off to college to study in Spain. So we'll, we'll talk more about the, 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 the need and understanding of how language maybe even opens the door to understanding culture. Let me uh, take a few minutes and introduce our mentor moms here. Uh, Camille Casaretti, tell us a little bit about us. Some of you may have met her and heard her in our last series of podcasts. So thanks for joining us again, Camille. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation to be here. I really appreciate it. Um, So I have two children. Um, They are currently in middle and high school, both in public school. 
I am a public school graduate myself. I um, grew up in Brooklyn, New York, and I'm still living here. <laughs> and um, I am currently on the Community Education Council in our district. Um, community Education Councils are like school boards across the country um, in that we advocate for student needs. Um, we work out rezoning plans for the district and we work with the superintendent, but in New York City, there is mayoral control. So we don't quite have the same authority that local school boards have, but we are able to get a lot of work done um, in supporting our students. So thanks for, thanks for your time. Great. We'll hear more about some of your experiences uh, in the work that you're doing in CEC and and I'm sure some some conversation about uh, your 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 childhood and how that maps to some of the things that Jasper is experiencing. I want to welcome back to our podcast as well, Shino Tanakwa, who you heard again in our previous conversations. Uh, Sheena, tell everyone and remind everyone who you are and, and uh, how you're involved in, in uh, public education in uh, New York City. Thank you, Neil. Um, and thank you, Dr. Ansari, for inviting me back. And it's great to see you, Jasper and Camille. My name is Shino. I'm a parent of two daughters. They are 26 years old and 18 years old. So they're not in the public school system anymore in New York City but they grew up in Manhattan's community school district too, which is the Southern part of Manhattan. And they both went to public schools, but they chose different middle and high schools. So between the two kids, I have experience with five different public schools in New York City. Um, I've served on the PTA, I've served on the school leadership team, I served on the community education council for district two, which is the same thing that um, Camille is serving on in District 15, and I just recently got appointed to serve on the Citywide Council on High Schools. So this has been a journey for quite a long time, and it will continue to be a journey for a long time to come. Thanks so much, Sheena, for joining us again. And uh, I want to introduce uh, another student who's joined us for the conversation, uh, who has a wonderful story to tell us as well. Uh, Sune, please tell us a little bit about who you are, where you go to school, and then we'll dive into a little bit of a conversation with you and Jasper about your experiences. Hi, I'm Sune Chavla. I'm going to be a freshman um, in ninth grade at Bronx High School in the fall in New York City. I am 14 years old, and I've been a member of the New 3Rs for uh, a little bit less than a year now. Welcome to the conversation. You know, you know Sine and, uh, and Jasper, you know, you've been kind of active parts of the, the new three R's and uh, really playing an important part of, of the conversations we're having. Um, and I'll start with you, Jasper. Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, how the new three R's has maybe impacted you about your awareness about race and history uh, and how that has that experience now has opened your eyes to some experiences there at your school? Well, it is, you know, it is jaw dropping how much I have learned compared to how much, I, like in the new three hours, how much I've learned vers versus how much I've learned from school. Like, all, like, I. My school was very, very, very Latinx. Like, there were, in my grade, I'll say, there was one black kid and one Asian kid. And there were, like, maybe five white, five to six white kids, and all the rest were Latinx. And there was 80 kids in my grade. So... As you can, very Latinx. Just want to get that out of the way, so you know why most of my education was Latinx culture oriented. Um, but every year I'd learn the same thing in Black History Month. I would learn that Rosa Parks, you know, 
I learned about Rosa Parks and how she defied segregation by staying on the bus and Martin Luther, Martin Luther King and the Civil Rights Act and then Ruby Bridges. And that's it. That That's all I learned for five years. Four years. Started learning in first grade, ended in fifth grade, and... Last year in sixth grade, I, um, uh, my teacher, my history teacher, I guess, it was Black History Month, and, you know, the month was coming to a close, and I asked if, um, I asked if we were going to learn any, any black history at all, and, uh, she said that it wasn't in the curriculum, and, um, I wasn't happy about that in the slightest. Um, but I do understand why. Because, you know, pandemic learning is not the easiest of things. Um, also, so she was following the curriculum very strictly. And also, for sixth grade, I learned ancient history but you could have put ancient black history in there that, that's a possibility um so that's kind of been my exposure to black history and like i've learned so much from the new three hours it's just amazing how much i didn't know so i'm very I'm very grateful for that. Thanks, thanks for that, Jasper. I think that you know, goes to show, and on for so many of our educations, uh, certainly mine. Um, you know, if it wasn't from my parents or my curiosity for reading, uh, you know, I wouldn't have learned you know half the amount of Black history it was. Because again, same thing. I remember ancient history in sixth grade. That's what we had, right? I know, learned a lot about the Romans and. And everything else, but not about my even my own culture. And then that was, you know, solely relying on what I needed to to learn or my parents taught me. You know, Sine, how about your experience? Are you having a different experience in your school or is it uh, a little bit about the same? So I think mirroring what Jasper said, the absolutely amazing amount of knowledge that you realize was right in front of you or just there out in the world that wasn't really presented to you as a child and um in my elementary school actually it was just a mere uh you know consideration of the month they would say you know happy black history month just to say it we wouldn't learn anything we'd just continue on where we were which was sadly uh, a white man or a, a white racist history predominantly and um, I think just this year and I'm going into ninth grade just in eighth grade did I start learning about some sort of black voice at least in depth and I think with the ever-growing um, kind of movement around the Black Lives Matter movement that happened um, earlier uh, in the summer of 2020 that's how schools had kind of adapted. But I realized from my friends that that didn't happen to all the schools, where most schools were still continuing with their predominantly white or predominantly Latinx uh, curriculums, which didn't really encompass the um, Black history movement. And then on top of that, not only is it knowledge, but I think something that has really opened my eyes with the new three R's is that people aren't afraid to have the conversations and the uncomfortable conversations that people steer away from in schools. Um, at school, once the going gets tough, then the teacher says, okay, let's wrap up the discussion for today. Uh, let's move to something more lighthearted. And that often, uh, you know, kind of strays us from the truth or strays us from some sort of self-realization that will eventually, you know, help us in the end. But with the new three R's, I saw that everybody was 
in there together in the sense that everybody was willing to be uncomfortable together. Everybody was willing to make realizations about the world around them, no matter how uncomfortable or, or how uh, out of place that put them. They were ready to make those and they were ready to help others make those decisions. So that's uh, two of the main things I learned with the new three R's. You mentioned really something very powerful in this notion of if, if accepting being uncomfortable about these conversations, which uh, is you know is a phrase that we're hearing a lot more in the last year. You know, certainly, as a as as a, a a black person in this country, we we've, we've kind of accepted some of those uncomfortable conversations, and now you know, you know. I, 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 I guess you know what we're hoping to see, and and maybe you're you're hinting toward that. And that is that maybe we're finally getting a point where where let's kind of get these conversations out there and at least begin them somewhere. If they're not going to happen in school, then we got to have them somewhere. Is is that what you 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 agree? Absolutely, absolutely. That same with you, Jasper. I mean, you mentioned kind of being in this this school, Latinx, uh, predominantly in some cases. Uh, is that that conversation, that uncomfortable conversation, or you know, what is that necessary to get people to understand each other and and uh, get along with each other better? I mean, yes. I if you can. If you can get someone to bear through the tough conversations, then they will, they will see more what you see. If you can, if they can put in that small bit of effort, that small bit of self-realization, small bit of self-criticism, you know, judging of the self, then you can, then, then they will it's kind of like a jumping into a whole new way of seeing life because you you look at someone and you wonder what life are they living you know you could see this really rich white man and you could see you could ask yourself what are his problems? Everyone has problems. Is he a racist? Is he not? Is he an activist? And then you could see, like, you know, in LA, there's a lot of homeless people that you would see. So you would ask yourself, how did they become homeless? You know, you start to ponder what people's life story is, what their experience is, how their experience is different from yours. And I think that's a very valuable tool because then if, and then you can see what is their life currently. Cause if you can, you know, ask them some questions then you can think, oh, we have the same things here and if you know what their life experience is, then you can you can help them if they need help. They can help you if you need help. So, I I think um, I think it provides better connections. You know, just better observance, better tolerance, better. It's just an overall good thing. Wow, well, that's some great observations and insights. Uh... Jess, we're at the sense of understanding who we are and who someone else is and, and what shoes, you know, what has their life's journey been to get them to that point. Uh, and yeah, that, that, that is a powerful kind of conversation that says we, you know, once you begin to talk to people, it's amazing how much in common you have than those differences. It's, 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 I think that's more than a cliche. We've heard, we've heard a lot, but I think that's that conversation, the one help, one simple phrase of "Hey, how you doing?" Right? That's that's a simple common phrase that can really bring people together in so many different ways. Um, there was a, a a letter one of uh, your classmates uh, wrote, uh, and I just want to uh, read an excerpt of it. Uh, and Jasmine Sunay, and I'd love to get uh, some reaction to you. And uh, 
it, it's, it read in part, 2020 has been a sad year. COVID making us quarantine and the Black Lives Matter protests sparked once more because of the death of George Floyd. Even iconic and historic changing events of the, of the passing of Black America's superheroes, John Lewis and Chadwick Boseman has made this truly a depressing year. For me, this class has taught me things about my country and allowed me to say what I am thinking about racism and learn all the great things Black people have given America and their sacrifices. The new three R's gives me hope and strength and for that, I'm grateful. So now how do you react to that, uh, that comment uh, and that statement, which is, is so insightful? Yeah, first of all, that's an incredibly powerful statement and, and very well said. Um, truly that the new three R's is, I think, a very uh, large beacon of hope for, for all of us. Um, and it really, it really helps us empathize going back to your last question. And I think that's, Empathy is one of the, the most important tools in, in solving a problem. And in a problem this uh, large and this great and this embedded into our society, uh, we have to learn how it feels before we can try and find a solution. Because if you're um, a plumber working on an electric bulb, why would you kind of help anything, right? you wouldn't get anywhere. So we need to learn as a country with organizations like the three R's, how exactly um, others are feeling like Jasper was saying. Um, and like the excerpt was also saying, uh, the, the new three R's is, is teaching us so much about our country as well. Um, and there's just a whole nother side that, uh, the new three R's has given me, which is not just that there's black history now, but hey, if there's so much untapped knowledge that I didn't know about for the last, what, 14 years of my life, how much more is there? How much more is there for me to learn? And I think that has sparked some sort of curiosity in me or some sort of hunger in me for, for more, um, almost, that hey, so if this is one story, I wonder how somebody else would tell it. I wonder how a Black person would tell it. I wonder how a Latinx person would tell it. And I'd like to think that the new three R's, like the excerpt saying, uh, made me a more open-minded individual uh, because I do think now I try to empathize more. And I think I can empathize a little bit more than I could maybe two or three years ago. Um, and that is very powerful, at least for me, and that's very powerful change because once I empathize, I feel like I can truly become part of the fight towards active anti-racism. I really think I can contribute both to my community, my class, uh, to my friends, my family, but I can't do that without organizations like the three R's. Uh, and, and I'm curious, Sine, I mean, yeah, through the course of your day, how often do you have to, do you get this question of, so where are you from? <laughs> what, what's that name? How do you pronounce your name? What's that experience like? And how do you, you uh, have you gotten used to it? And how do you kind of, how do you kind of begin to tell your story to people who, you know, are somewhat curious, but sometimes those questions come out as, why are you asking me where I'm from? Uh, you, do you ask? Anyone else? So to, to tell us a little bit about that experience. So um, living in, in New York City, it seems like everybody has a different story, of course. Um, and so, yes, there are, you know, towards the beginning of the year, there are the questions, hey, where are you from? Where are uh, your father from? And then there's this question, um, that somebody asked me once, I, I don't recall whether it was in fifth grade or sixth grade, somebody asked me, where are you really from? And I was like, what? And uh, I am born in the United States. I lived here for two years. Um, and then I lived in India for seven. I moved back in 2016. 
Um, so I have a little bit of an Indian accent. And so I could see clearly that there was some sort of, um, I guess, ulterior motive behind that question. Because when they asked me, where are you from? I said, hey, so I'm from the United States, but I identify more as Indian. And they're like, wait, but where are you really from? Like I was hiding something um, in my past that I didn't want to tell them. And so I think I begin to tell my story um, from my time in, in India, mainly because, first of all, I don't remember much of my time in the US, but I do feel like uh, my life truly started um, and my current relationships and who I am was shaped mostly because of that seven years. And uh, going to your question about, you know, how that makes me feel, I didn't think much of it at first um, because, hey, you know, I didn't have experience with questions like that. Nobody asks questions like that if, you know, you're in India or really I haven't had that experience anywhere else um so when when people ask me that question I like to think that they have the best intentions possible but sometimes when that's not true I tend to be a little bit um blindsided to that reality uh and I reflect later, I wonder, hmm, what was those intentions? And again, I'd like to think they're, they're good intentions and they really are wondering where I'm from and they're wondering what my story is. But I think the fact that I have to grapple with whether those intentions are true or not is something that needs to change in our society because 12 year olds and 13 year olds should not be thinking that on a daily basis yeah that thanks for uh, answering that question and and jasper i wanted to bounce to you a little bit to react to uh the letter from uh, your classmate donovan and a little bit about your own experience of, of having conversations with students uh, i'm sure again as you said you have latinx students and others and, and about their yeah, their cultural experiences and how you you uh, you you share your experiences to make that greater bond with them. Well, you know, like Sune said, um, Donovan's letter is very very powerful. It's um he said something very similar in class once, and um, you know. I can't remember. I I got very emotional after he said it because he was basically describing what it was like to be a black boy. And, um, you know, it really, it really hit me hard because I realized his life was a lot more different than mine. It was a lot, you know, it, I personally don't know if it was harder or not. I, it to me it sounded harder because he had to deal with all that judgment. You know, people, people at a glance see him do something, they would assume he's up to no good because I don't know. That's a that's a cultural, that's a cultural thing. It's I. And it really needs to change. It really needs to change because, like, if I did that same thing, no one would think anything of it. So, I don't know. It's it's just so messed up how our society is. And I believe Donovan really, really made a very powerful, very punctual, very effective, efficient message with that with that um what would you call it a ex excerpt something like yeah um but yeah uh that's kind of what i have to say about that and to your other question 
uh, what was your experience with talking to other students? Yeah, I mean, you know, it was in talking to Sune about his kind of life experience and for you in, in relating to others who are different cultures, you know, how do you bridge that gap? How do you, you know, try to feel comfortable with people who may be uncomfortable with you and vice versa? What's, what's your approach to getting yeah, in those conversations? Well, the way I made most of my connections in elementary school was more of it wasn't me going up to every single person asking them if we wanted to be friends right because i wasn't that kind of person um i was very friendly and things you know friends came naturally to me but my strategy was a lot more I talk to this person, they're friends with these people. If I'm friends with them, I might be able to be friends with them. So then I not only have one friend, I have three. So it, because the more similar you are to someone, the more relatable you are, the faster friendships can, not will, can develop. So, I'll tell you, most of my friends um, in grade school and still now are white because that's because my best friend was uh, both of them and I met them in preschool and they were both white because I went to a majority white preschool and then so one of them was a year older than me so I, I didn't really get to meet his friends. And so that that kind of helps because if there's someone more more charismatic than you, who can talk to people better than, you know, if you're friends with them, they can introduce you to their friends. And then you don't you don't have to be putting in all that extra work. So then, then once you're good friends with them, then you can talk about those uncomfortable situations with them faster. So it's, I don't know, it's, that was my personal strategy for making friends. And now I kind of can apply that to um, teaching people about, uh, you know, trying to change our entire society because it is messed up. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm more encouraged in talking to you and Sine and to know that you all are out there really, uh, you know, truly on the front lines, helping to change the conversations and helping to change the attitudes of your peers in so many different ways that I think has, to me, a cascading uh, influence uh, in, in these conversations and as we look to the future. I want to uh, take a moment and, and kind of bring in our, our mentor moms into the conversation and, and uh, initially try to get some some reaction to some of the uh, of the comments we've heard from uh, our students and and she you know um, I, I saw both you and Camille nodding your heads as they were talking and, and listening so intently. She you know what 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 do you hear in the words that they say and what do you think as as you hear them. Oh my goodness, there are just so many different things going through my head. Um, but I want to start with this immense feeling I have of gratitude and hope for Sune and Jasper. Because I don't know too many people my age that I interact with who can articulate the things that you both just shared with us. So you two are light years ahead of grown-ups of my generation, particularly the privileged ones. So thank you for doing what you do. I, I'm really, really grateful. At the same time, I feel pain because 
I am seeing how racism and the structural racism and the systems of oppression really dehumanize all of us. White people, black people, brown people, Asian people, all people are dehumanized by the system that we have in place in this country. I hear the pain in Jasper's voice in seeing this system for what it is. I see the pain in Sine having to explain where he's from. And Sine, I have to say, intent doesn't matter. The fact that people ask you, but not people who are white, that's proof enough that they're asking you that question of where are you from is rooted in racism. They may be genuinely curious, but they have to stop to think, why is it that they pick you to ask where you're from? But likely not Jasper or Camille. But I get that all the time. And as a former English language learner who is an affluent immigrant, I used to say, yes, I'm from Japan. But then after I hit that point where I'd spent more time in this country, than I did in my home country, that's when I started to think, well, how long do I have to live here for people to stop asking me that freaking question? That's when I started to think, okay, you know what? This feels wrong to me. And if it feels wrong, then it probably is wrong. Trust your instinct. And yes, I'm not saying label those people evil, but let's call it what it is. It is othering and othering is a form of racism. And it might just be an opportunity for you to educate somebody if you feel comfortable enough to say, hey, I was born here, I grew up in India, but I'm, I'm American. And why is it that you ask me? Did you ask that customer down there or did you ask my friend who's white? It could be a conversation starter. There's so much more I want to say, but I'll just stop there because I know Camille probably is dying to say things too. So I'll hand it over to you, Camille. It's so hard to follow Shino. <laughs> um, she is somebody that I admire so much and um, am really inspired by, but these two boys, they are um, just sensational. And I am completely there with Shino about how they are so far ahead of their time. Um, as they were both telling stories, I was thinking about when I was their age and, and maybe a little younger. And um, my mother always used to say that the first word out of my mouth was why. And so I was a child who was very curious and wanted to understand why things were the way they were. And I got in a lot of trouble for that. <laughs> um, I was often silenced and, you know, didn't have the answers that I was looking for. And, um, you know, Shino used the word hope, and that was absolutely something that I was feeling listening to Jasper and Sunai. Um, it, it was um, something that I had held on to, a hope that I would find the answers I was looking for. Um, and, and it took a lot of years. Um, I mean, I did not find safe space for conversations until I was in college. Um, and even then, it was sometimes challenging. Um, and I think that a lot of this comes um, you know, from, from these systematic racist practices that had been put in place by redlining. And, um, you know, and, and we see that still in our school system. Um, so I grew up in a mostly white affluent neighborhood. Um, but my parents, were um, very young when they had me and we lived in a house, but it was a house that my grandparents owned. 
Um, and so, you know, you, you see how this intergenerational wealth plays itself out. And, and we're still seeing that today. And, um, and the school zones and the way they're set up are continuing segregation. So, you know, unless we're going to actively um, change admissions policies and really value uh, diversity and integration and inclusion, we're not going to see a lot of change. Um, you know, certainly not in, in the next few years. But um, I think that every little move that we make towards a more equitable society is making a change. And, and that's the hope that I'm hanging on to. <laughs> so um, I'm just so happy and excited to know that Jasper and Sunai are here um, doing this work. And you might hit a couple of walls along the way, but know that there are so many people who really want to see the world exist in your eyes, the way you're seeing it, the way you want to see it. Um, so I, you know, advice that I would give to you, if, if in some moments you're just feeling like this is so hard and I just don't, think I can do this anymore. Stop talking to the people you're talking to that are bringing you down and just like, you know, find a new group. And sometimes that's what we have to do. We have to just kind of like do a purge like a self-purge. And sometimes that happens in your closet. And sometimes it happens to the, you know, the people you're surrounding yourself with. And, um, and you guys are amazing. And I'm so glad to know you. I, I love what you said, Camille, is that you, you really have to think about the people you're surrounding yourself with. And, and, uh, you know that 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 uh, is hard sometimes as a you know as a teenager as you guys are is to make those decisions of who you are friends with and who you aren't with. But fast forward to us 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 uh, uh, older folks, uh, you know we face some of those same journeys as well. Uh, we have a little bit more flexibility because our lives are a little bit more controlled and and we can do that. But I think you know all through life. Uh, you know, we, we're posed with these questions and even more so than ever, and ever. I mean, for a good part of my career, I would always get the question, and which is why I asked you today, it's like, oh, Neil, well, so Neil, where are you from? Where are your parents from? Where? And I, I love that, what you said, where are you really from? I, well, Bed-Stuy, I grew up in Brooklyn. My parents grew up in Brooklyn. Well, how did you get out of Bed-Stuy? Um, B-52 bus, the A train, the GG, you know, the F train, you know, <laughs> so, you know, uh, the, these questions, uh, oh, 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 that's right. Oh, my, my dad had a car too, right? So he could take me places, right? How amazing, right? Which, which is, you know, some of this uh, conversation that you, you take in stride, which is, again, I think what you and Jasper and Sine are doing as, as well. And and, and, and Gina, what advice uh, from your experiences you've been working with in your role, certainly in, in the, 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 the CEC in many ways, but also uh, what's your advice to, to the, this, the, the, these young, young men here and the other young men and women who are part of, of the change that we're seeing and, and how they keep the faith and keep, keep their drive forward and keeping the message going on on how change is needed? Um. I'm a firm believer in self-care. So you need to make sure you are well. And when I say you're well, it's not just your physical health, but it's your mind and soul, right? So make sure your mind, soul, body are in good condition because you cannot do this work if one of the three is out of whack. And when you're young, you may think you're invincible, you can do this, but even then, this is really taxing work. It's emotionally taxing, it's taxing on your soul, which, and if you're taxing your mind and soul and emotion, and then you're actually taxing your body too. So make sure to set aside time to do something that just makes you feel good, whatever that is. That's not part of this work, right? 
So you can't be watching like 13 or <laughs> one of those really serious documentaries. You should do something that just is pure fun. Um, part of that, I'm a firm believer in nature therapy. Just go outside, hug a tree, go walk amongst the trees, go to a waterfront, stare at the water body, whatever it is. Huge boost to your three things that you need. Um, and I agree with Camille. Get rid of people that you can't really be with, right? I, I, it's easier said than done, or at least limit your interactions with some of those people, even if they used to be your close friends. I think you really, that's part of taking care of your spiritual side and emotional side. And surround yourself with a lot of people who are doing this work as well. There is nothing like being in community with people who do the same work. That's a source of energy. And that's definitely what keeps me going. So kind of a wishy-washy, new agey thing, but that's what I have to say. But I, I love it. I love it. I, I want to kind of wrap up what with kind of Sune and, and Jasper. Tell us, you know, how do you uh, get more students engaged? You know, what's your advice to them? What's your, your, your words to, to kind of get them to, to share in your, your experience? Uh, what advice would you have for them, Jasper? Well, you know, me and my mom, my mom makes, you know, she put me into the new three hours. I didn't have a choice, but you know, I didn't want to either. I didn't, I didn't know the problems that were going on. So, you know, I was very happy about it once, once I had done it, but my, my friends, they all, they're all, you know, they're not, they're not all terrible Confederate loving people. They're just, they, they get uncomfortable whenever I try to speak about it. So, you know, my advice to them is just try it, you know, just do it, do it for a couple of months, see if you like it or not, join a group. You know, I think really as much as it sounds like terrible parenting just forcing your children to do something just do it 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 will help them so much it's i cannot you know children um children only want fun um, yeah, that's about it. That That's all they want. That's why they don't like school. This is basically school and work combined. So it's the ultimate children destroyer. Um, but they are passionate and, you know, actually care about people. Then, you know, they'll enjoy it. They'll, cause this isn't, this isn't the hard work this is more you know education learning about uh, things so yeah just try it you know have your kids try it and if they if, if um if any of the kids want to try it for themselves ask their parents to sign them up it helps a lot thank you Jessa. Sine, what what advice do you have for your classmates and others who you uh, you know should be you, you, that you might want to have them share your journey? What do you tell them? How do you get them engaged? What to, why should they get involved in having these uncomfortable conversations? Yeah, that that's a great question. First of all, um, and yeah, like like Jasper, I thought the new three hours was going to be a book club. Um, so 
you know, I didn't know I was in for the, you know, ride of my life. But um, yeah, I think Jasper spoke a lot to education and, and just doing it. And I feel like, yes, that's absolutely the, the first step, um, which is when I think of how do I get people to understand what the actual effects of racism are in our society? How do I get them to see that it's not just surface level, okay, so, you know, uh, this happened 300 years ago. It's all done. We swept it under the rug and we don't need to talk about it now. Um, and yes, education is absolutely the first step because I think each step leads into the other. Education, I feel, leads to some sort of empathy. Um, empathy leads to some sort of self-realization, which means you're looking in the mirror and you're saying, okay, so what am I doing to actually uh, maybe actually benefit this, this whole systemic racism um, kind of agenda? And that is a hard conversation to have with yourself. Uh, and I think before you can have a conversation with anybody else and, and tell them how, how you're feeling, you need to understand how you're feeling first. Um, and that's I, I know from experience that's a little bit hard for me to to look at because um of course i mean who would want to willingly admit to everybody that they're wrong or that they have some sort of bias in their mind that that makes them um kind of have preconceived notions about a certain group of people and when i when i recognize those those biases happening and when I did recognize those biases happening because of the, the way that I was brought up or you know whatever media I was uh, kind of exposed to growing up then I, I try to stop myself and think and recognize that yes this is happening what do you think triggered it and how can we avoid it in the future <clears throat> excuse me so yes empathy um, self-realization and I also think an education, um, but I also think in the sense of self-realization, people need to recognize their privilege and take a look at their privilege. And I think it's systemic racism is just so embedded in our society now. It's not just about the color of your skin anymore. It's become about your socioeconomic class and that kind of uh, protecting you or that, um, you know, kind of making you uh, maybe somehow, you know, half uh, white or, you know, some sort of uh, assimilation that every immigrant has to go through in order to become more American. So um, I think it, it's really important also to, for people to look at their privilege. And then if they can't look at their privilege, then it's my job to not remind them, but to open their eyes, whether that be in the form of um, poetry, whether that be in the form of information, whether that just be in the form of, hey, so let's talk about this, or what do you know about this? And um, I think those are those are the, the, the main things. And, and lastly, um, I think once you recognize that you have privilege or social standing, using it to your advantage to lead by example is really important because, you know, in a society where, where power is, is one of the, the key influences behind many of our decisions and the way we, we actually follow people, right? Um, why do you think, there's such a large following of um, like the Confederate army. Uh, even to this day, it's been what, like two centuries since the civil war. It all comes back to this one root issue of power. And once people recognize that they have that power, but they use it to their advantage instead of furthering um, their, their own class and stepping back and maybe giving up some of their privilege so that we can have a more equal society, then I think 
society itself can truly progress, um, both as a whole and individually in our communities. Well said. I don't know what else to say after that. I think that was so well said. Uh, what a wonderful conversation. Uh, Jasper, Sune, you know, you all uh, give us all great inspiration. Uh, I want to thank you for taking some time out of this, this, uh, this afternoon to join us for the conversation. I meant to moms, Camille and Sheena, you all are, are wonderful advocates, you know, doing the hard work um, as parents, as well as, as uh, you know, politically and, and working through the, the, the systems to raise awareness about uh, these equities and not being uh, uh, fearful about speaking up, which only helps provide greater inspiration for Sine and Jasper and the many other students, uh, you know, those who are involved in the three R's and those who are uh, working, walking in schools around the country, uh, trying to learn about each other, learn about themselves, understand the systems in which they're in, understanding and embracing their own identities, uh, un uh, seeking better understanding about race, culture, and history. Uh, but thank you so much for joining us for this wonderful conversation. Uh, there's so much more to talk about and stay tuned to the Your Story is Our Stories podcast because we will have more of these conversations. Hi. I'm Dan Gore, and welcome to this episode of Black History Fact. Today, I'm going to be speaking about Junius G. Groves. Junius George Groves is a successful self-educated former landowner and entrepreneur, became one of the most prosperous African-American men in the early 20th century. Born a slave on April 12, 1859, in Louisville, Kentucky, Junius George Grove relocated to Kansas at the age of 19 as an exoduster. He worked at the meatpacking houses in Armadale and later moved to Edwardsville. Here, Groves purchased 90 acres of land and began to raise white potatoes. His business prospered and he became known as the potato king of the world because he reportedly grew more bushels of potato per acre than anyone else in the world. He also bought and shipped potatoes, seed potatoes, and other produce, as well as owning a store in Edwardsville and having numerous other business interests. The Union Pacific Railway built a special spur to his property to accommodate his needs. He was a founding member of the Kansas State Negro Business League, the Caw Valley Potato Association, the Sunflower State Agricultural Association, and the Pleasant Hill Baptist Church Society. He was featured in Booker T. Washington's book, The Negro Business in 1907. At the height of his success, he owned more than 500 acres Groves and his wife Matilda built a 20 room mansion which featured the latest comforts of the day, electricity, hot and cold running water, and telephones. In the early 1900s, he founded the community of Groves Center near Edwardville, selling small tracts of land to African-American families he also built a golf course for African-Americans, possibly the first such course in the country. Junius Groves died in Edwardsville in 1925. I'm Danny Gore, and this has been this episode of Black History Fact. Thanks for joining.